Hello, Maverick fans. Welcome to another edition of the Mav Puck Cast. I am Jason here with you again, and we've got a pair of Brooks with us today. That's John, right. John and Bridget are on the podcast. Yay! So, special edition. I don't know what this is going to do. We're going to feel this out. <laughs> I'm a little... Oh, you guys will... know you've been begging me to come on here. This is, it's about time. We have full disclosure every week. Full disclosure, this happened via text message on my drive back from Minnesota. <laughs> They're like, hey, what if Bridget comes on the podcast? I'm like, yeah, sure, I'm driving. I don't know what I'm going to say. It was say. a group text, too, so you were like totally peer pressured into it. And I literally was driving, so I'm trying to like not steer the car off the road as I'm reading my watch. Well, the only other fan, or I, the only other fan... Well, the, only, the only other guest we've had this season was Dan. Right. Back at the beginning of the season. So we haven't had, you know, last season we had Connor on. We did? We haven't had a guest. So we, we needed to have another guest before the end of the season. Well, and Jason's kids have been lobbying to be the guest. So you might have another guest by the end of the season. But... Yeah, we may have to bring on the mini me Mav puckers. And... Yeah, I think so. I think so. They at would some point that. here. That would be fun. Future podcast content. Yep. <laughs> So our Mavericks at home, Western Michigan in town. We, I was surprised. I don't know. You guys were at the game. Obviously, we were not. We were up in Minnesota. And they showed some of the stat stuff during the Friday game on the broadcast about the record. And I was surprised to see that UNO held the lead in like overall record in this series well it because, dates back a long time though. right so and i guess that's that's probably why it surprised me is because recently i felt that we've really struggled against western michigan yeah um, but notoriously apparently before i came around that was much more lopsided in our direction we struggle against nchc western michigan but we used to have success more success in previous conferences yeah, against CCHA Western Michigan, it was, they were that was that was at a time they were kind of perennially at the bottom of the conference back then. It's been really interesting to see how that program has managed to kind of reinvent itself the last few years. It's it's pretty impressive because, like I said, they were kind of the doormat of the CCHA, and they've. But that was before Andy Murray came in. I mean, he's really turned that program around for sure. Yeah, and I can't remember when he was hired, but he really has. I mean, he, yeah, that was, they definitely made, when they hired him, they were definitely making a commitment. And then they ended up in the NCHC, which honestly was at the time kind of a surprise, but they, I mean, they've done a great job under him. So, um, you know, former NHL head coach. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. So I know we've struggled against them in the NCHC years, so. But not as much this weekend. Yay! <laughs> yeah, UNO played two pretty good games. Friday, I was, I don't know. It was kind of ugly. Was, it was an ugly game. Really it was worried ugly. about. I was like, oh man. And Saturday Friday was a little bad. ugly, but a better outcome. So. Yeah, I they played. I felt they played much better uh, on Saturday. I still think the same problem. You know, we've talked a little bit about it on the podcast and. I try not to get too much into like the the data and analytics side of things because I don't want people to fall asleep while they're listening to the podcast. Uh, but I am very much interested to see us up our coursey. I'd I'd like to see us play more of a puck possession game, and we we don't. We seem to be rush a lot. And, Speaking of Brooks, John's dad had a very wise sentiment on Friday night, and it was something along the lines of, you know, you can't score if you don't shoot the puck. <laughs> right. And there were several points during Friday night's game where we were being outshot two to one. Mm -hmm. And it was a little even, a little more even on Saturday, but you're absolutely correct. If you are not controlling the puck, uh, there's a good chance it's going to end up in the back of your net instead of in your opponent's net. Yeah, and that happened in the first two NCHC series of the new year against North Dakota and Denver. We were outshot significantly in both of those, if I recall correctly. And it was because I, you and I had talked about that on a, either last week's podcast or the podcast before that. And 
It is. It's when they can't get anything established in the offensive zone, you're you're really dependent on it being a game that's like within a goal or kind of knotted up the whole way so that, you know, when you are able to break free out of the defensive zone and start moving in transition and get, you know, kind of odd man rushes and things like that, that then you can have success. It's it's tough. They're, they, they have a tough time, you know, getting anything established and like you said, it's the, you know, it's the Corsi, the Corsi stat. It's the puck possession yeah. part of the game. We have, we have trouble with that. And we definitely had trouble with that on Friday. I mean, there are some teams, uh, Hockey East is notorious for this, for teams that have good Corsis, but poor outcomes. And it's typically because their shots that they do get don't come from They're not high, high quality. accuracy, right? High They're quality. not high quality scoring opportunities. Uh, I, th- and I think that was our problem was that I think I saw that, that we got out shot like 40 to 24, 40, to 28 or something like that on Friday. And I'm like, I mean, that's a lot of shots. The problem was that it seemed like a lot of those shots were like grade a opportunities. We, we, we let them have some oh. prime Seville was areas and blocking and bouncing and yeah, we were outshot 40 to 25. I put that in a note on my yeah. iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, any it's it's Friday. tough to Friday. it's tough to win a game if you're going to let your goaltender see 40 pucks. Yeah. It's it's always going to be a rough night. Whoever's in net, it doesn't matter. And we had that problem last year uh with Winnegar. He just saw too many shots sometimes and our defense in you know didn't limit the prime opportunities in the center of the ice. They didn't live, limit the short side opportunities. They didn't limit the puck front possession stuff. And those are the things that just drive goalies crazy and, and give them nightmares. And, and we're kind of getting back into that a little bit. The good thing is, is that it seems like we've found a way to kind of right the ship. So we seem to have those kinds of games on Friday. And then Saturday, we come back and have a much better effort. Um, and shot-wise, we we outshot them on Saturday. I was, well, I would say 28 to 26, 20, uh, we outshot okay. them on Saturday. And again, it give, gave us a much better opportunity to right. stay in the game. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And they were without one of their top scorers this weekend in Paul Washi. So mm-hmm. I was hopeful that that might make <laughs> that that might make a difference, but it ultimately didn't. They're they're a good, strong team. They've got a lot of big players. Very. They physical. do a lot of little. Th- they're very physical. They're chippy at times. Yeah. I mean, they're they're definitely one of the biggest collection of goons in the NCHC for sure. But but I'll tell you what, Andy Murray has those guys playing really really well. And that's going to be, I, I would not expect that to change. That's going to be Western Michigan's system knowing Murray and his past in the NHL and that stuff. Is, this is a team that's going to rely on goaltending and Grinding. defense, grind it out. You know, you would expect them to win a lot of low scoring affairs and they're just going to limit your chances and limit your shots. And I'm sure that on their, on their whiteboard going into this weekend, keeping Omaha under 25 shots a game is a recipe for success. So uh, they, they did what they needed to do to get two wins out of it. You know, we were just fortunately we hard fought enough luck. to find a way to get a win on Saturday. And we had a little bit of luck on Saturday too, that yeah. wasn't there on Friday. The, the guys are really motivated in the third. I thought like that third period of Saturday's game they seem to be really on their horse. Like we've got to find a way to do this. We can't let it slip away. And and we've been good in the third period in a lot of games. So yeah. that that is good. They don't give up and just kind of shut down. Yeah, they've got the the horses. <laughs> Anti Bronco, but they got the horses for the whole game. Yeah, the second periods are the ones that have hurt us, and they kind of hurt us in both of these affairs too. So yeah, they definitely did. And I thought Kevin Conley was impressive this weekend. Obviously, we got to give Taylor Ward the shout out for getting the hat trick on Saturday night. Is he your pick for the player? Then are we jumping to that? Um. N- well, no, we weren't. Yes, jumping. we are. We are. <laughs> wow. Okay, we're moving. Jason's moving us through here. He's like, I just the I, ten we, minute we should, podcast. Here we, we go. Sh- we should make a note. We should make a note. By the way, that the Mavs the last couple weeks I think are undefeated when. Mike Gabinette doesn't wear his dark-rimmed glasses and instead wears his contact lens. 
So, I pointed that out several weeks ago, and apparently he was not wearing his glasses on Saturday. So, so if he finds his glasses broken in his office, we know who to hunt not down. Responsible. Somebody needs to send a message to Gab's wife and <laughs> say, don't let him wear his glasses. He's got to wear his contacts. Give, <laughs> give them to the kid and say, I didn't know you grabbed him. <laughs> but that t- only works as long as it works. But we're just saying this, is, this has been something we've noticed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no guarantees going I can forward. I can see the the game a lot better when I'm wearing my contacts as opposed to glasses so I mean maybe it's the same type of thing I remember a story about DU in the Glasdecki area that he the very first game of the season he had stepped in water and didn't have an extra sock so he went out and coached with one sock on and one sock off <laughs> and they won and he kept doing that until they lost and it was I think they went on like an 11 game winning streak and Every time they're like, coach with one sock out there. I'm like, I don't know if that story is true. Like, because obviously they've got no way to verify it. But I always remember that going, oh my gosh, some people in hockey are just It's crazy. true. Well, it's if you totally... follow along on Twitter, John was relegated to the basement during the Colorado College Series because <laughs> right? the comeback started when he went downstairs. So we're hockey fans. This is just the uh, way it works. You got to go with it. Yeah, the lady who sat in front of us turned around and I, I think she, I think it was her. I think she turned around and she's like, is there the equivalent of the basement you can go to during this Baxter. game at one point? <laughs> on Friday. On Friday. On Friday. Yeah. John's going to watch the game from the men's room. Or <laughs> something. So do we want to do our player of the yeah, weekend? Let's, let's do, do our do player. It. Okay. I am not going with Taylor Ward. Okay. But he'd be a worthy pick. Okay. I'm going with Kevin Conley. Okay. Because he was good both nights. And I'll he tell was. you what. He was great on Friday night. He got a goal, and he got an assist. We only got two goals in that game. But then Saturday night, Conley got um, a couple of assists. He had an assist on the Sullivan goal, an assist on one of the Ward goals. And I thought he was the guy. I mean, I just thought he was hustling. He was making good plays all weekend. So I got to, I mean, we've been impressed with him the last month. So I've got to go with Conley this weekend. And I think you picked him last weekend. I did, yeah. And Sullivan had two goals, and Conley had the assists on both of them. I think that 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 combination the last couple weeks seems to have had a lot of success. I kind of hope that Coach sticks with it because it seems like they're finding some chemistry. I think Ward's been on that line a bit. I know he was on that line on Saturday. Yeah, those three have been really good together. Yeah, so that's looking like you may have found something good there. Uh, so who's your player? I I will go with Ward only because he I thought he he was above average. I wouldn't he wasn't he didn't seem great to me on Friday, but he was solid and I'd say above average. But he really seemed to have the jump on Saturday. And any guy that gets a hat trick in a game that you win and comes up big with two late goals, I think you just got, you, you've got to kind of. Shout out to him, even though, I mean, the last one was like this miracle, long, empty netter, but still it counts. And so I'll, I'll pick, I'll pick Ward, but Conley was, was on my list to pick again. Yeah, they were both great. See, and this is my first time doing it. So I'm like, oh my gosh, what if I pick one of the ones that they pick? There's so many players on the team and it happens to us all the time. Like. (sighs) So That's why we we really should start doing this ahead of time so that we don't like. I, yeah. I like the unpredictability. It's it's nerve wracking. My <laughs> blood is just pumping here. But you mentioned Nolan Sullivan, and he is my yeah. choice. So we got all three of them. There we go. You know, right in there. Uh, Sullivan, he you know appeared on the official scoring summary. But what really impressed me was his work on the faceoffs. And on Friday night, oh my gosh, the, this one linesman, he was determined that we were going to do at least, you know, two drops of the puck for every single face-off. And so they kind of, they figured it out. At one point I turned to John, I said, I think they figured it out. They're going to put some other guy in first so he can get kicked out. And then then Nolan will come in in. and he'll win the (laughs) face-off. And again, I I think that was one of the bright spots on the the scoring stats and the scoring sheet and the stats all weekend was our face-off wins. And Nolan Nolan Solomon, I love watching him do face-offs. It's it's hilarious. Plus, we've got to make a meme of his little jig that he does during the great good old hockey song because <laughs> it makes me laugh every time I see it. Yeah, he's one of your favorites. 
He's a fan favorite. Uh, I, I took a video in yeah. the lobby afterwards. Uh, we finally got to do he, a we win, we sing, um, you know, video. And, oh, my gosh, the number of people that came up and talked to him. He's a fan favorite for sure. You mentioned that. that Julie and I realized when we were up, uh, when we were watching the game on Saturday, this is the first time that we have been out of town for ho- out of town for any reason and missed a home hockey game and they've won. This is the first Ooh. lobby thing that we've missed. Wow. Usually when we leave town, they lose both games. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because I didn't realize the Mavs had not won a conference game at home this season right. until this weekend. And I, I went we back and I'm Miami, like, yeah. we did. Yeah, I think we tied one against Miami, but mm-hmm. yeah, we had not. Tie was the best Jordan, result we'd gotten. Jordan pointed that out, the gateway reporter. And I yeah. was like, whoa, I did not know that. Hadn't realized it, but... But Nolan Sullivan was one of those that we saw uh, when we went to a Lancers game, and yeah. we were both really high on having him come in and expecting great things from him. And I know he had kind of a late start to the season getting over an injury and stuff, and this team seems to be much better with him than without him. So yeah, he's looking been a forward to three more maker. years of that. Yeah, yeah, we all like him. So, and like you said, the the was that the linesman number seventy seven. Again, we don't know his name, but man, he had trouble dropping the way. He kept whistling guys out. It was, it was he terrible. didn't have trouble. He just wanted it to be all about him. We've... But Nolan had a really good quote at the post game press conference. And like John's little note thing, I made a, a note of this one. He said, you know, part of it is on us. It's definitely our responsibility to slow up, make sure we're doing the right thing. But at the same time, some of the best centermen are the best cheaters out there. Mm-hmm. Your goal is to try to <laughs> jump the face off, make sure you're quick off the draw. And again, there's a lot of cheating going on, but he definitely has that ability to win yep. that draw. It's interesting because we were talking, the some of the hockey parents and I were talking a few weeks ago, and we had one of the UNO games on, and one of the parents was asking me about that because they knew that I, I played center when I played hockey for the longest of time, and, and one of the things that I was most known for is face-offs. Like, that was... I'd go through entire practices where I would do nothing but face-offs. That was my job, and that was, like, the only thing I was good at. So Nolan is um, the Jason it's, of you know, I don't know if I could live <laughs> just, up to that. Just saying. That's a little bit, a lot of a, that's a like stretch. Like, stroke his ego there. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm here, right? That's why I got invited on, right? That's right. Uh, but, like, I would totally agree with him. I mean, you knew, like, the little things that you could do to gain an advantage, and it, it's this sportsmanship it's this game kind of thing that you're always playing with someone else and he had just noticed that uh this other dad had noticed that we get thrown out of the dot a lot and was asking like well why do you get thrown out what's i'm like well sometimes it's a center fault sometimes they they jump the gun and, and they get they get going too much and sometimes it's the fault of the wingers they move before they're supposed to and like you get thrown out because they did something they weren't supposed to do right and so he's like well so is there any like thought to maybe putting your center on the wing and having him jump off so that the center gets thrown out and then the center actually comes in and wins the face off. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if coaches do that on purpose. I know from my coaching standpoint, I would totally do that on purpose. Like I said, Friday night, they made an adjustment doing exactly that. No one was getting kicked out then. And so they put in, I can't remember who got the majority of those after that, but then they would get kicked out and then, yeah, he would win it. So. I mean, NHL clubs do it in the latter, in the latter part of the games when you know you need a face-off win uh, because you're you're protecting a lead or, or you're trying to even a score or something like that. Uh, I mean, I don't know an NHL coach that doesn't throw two centers out sometimes. You know, especially if you're trying to win and you've got that extra attacker. A lot of times, that extra attacker is is a centerman because if I've got another guy I can throw in there and not lose on the 50 50 draw i'll take it every time now speaking of cheating i think we need to talk about uh, cheating, the though. western michigan goaltender on saturday night brandon bussy bridget would you like to not distra- a bad for freshman he, yeah. yeah oh no he's a he's, he's a great a, goaltender but yeah. but he would be cross check one of our players ward. to the back of the head to ward, ward to the back yeah. of the head ward was standing right in front of him and he just laid him out so bounced him right off of the ice there and i was i was really shocked that ward was not injured he went down a couple of different times this weekend and i was a little worried for him but that was that was a very unusual thing 
um, in terms of a fan. I don't know that I've ever seen a goalie um, do that, but he he took the penalty and. I, I've seen some goalies do some pretty. <laughs> he's, he's. I mean, the notorious yeah. thing is, is that when you've got a guy that's in your face a lot, and and that you know, if if they get pushed to the ice by your defenseman or something, goaltenders are pretty well known for falling on top of them and you know, blocker to the head type of thing, because that thing really hurts when you get hit in the head with it. So. Well, most goaltenders have a little bit of a nasty streak to them on those types of things. Your daughter, Lexi, and I were just watching <laughs> that, though, and he gives a little shrug like, what? What did Who I me? do? Yeah, well. so, kind of thing. So, like I said, he was crazy, though. Friday he, night, yeah. he went almost out to the blue line at one point to play a puck, and I was like, I really hoped he would do that a couple more times and it would just bite him, but... He didn't. I couldn't believe he got back and made that save. I that couldn't either. Shocked the no, heck I think him. he was shocked as heck. <laughs> when they, when, because I don't remember, I was watching on my phone at that point in time. I, I don't think we were back to the hotel. Um, so it was still on a smaller device. So it was hard to really tell. And so my first thought was that we didn't get back on side before they took the shot. And so it was off sides, but no, it was, it, it was, was all he actually side. got back and made the same. He, it was a very lucky play. We threw it at the net and he just happened to catch it at the right spot yeah. because he could have easily been out of position for how far out he was. But that wasn't the only time he did that. There was a couple of times when he went really roaming out of the net and I was hoping it would bite him, but I, I saw playoff predictors online on the on the drive home today and it has a i think they had like an 80 some percent chance that uno ends up going to western michigan for the nchc playoffs so i'm like great here we go we're gonna see i think we're gonna see a lot of busey over the next four years i I, so we're gonna have to find a way to get the better of him because he seems to be the the goaltender of the near future for western michigan and we're gonna need to solve that I think we can do it. Yeah. I think they should worry about Seville. <laughs> <laughs> I worry about Seville, but I worry about him being around for four years. <laughs> well, we, we, we don't know what will happen three years from now. We may win a national championship. We may lose a bunch of guys. You never know. <laughs> you never know what the hell will happen. It's like playoff predictors. Anything can happen yeah, in the anything next can happen. couple series. It's kind of like predicting the weather. I mean, <laughs> I feel fairly confident in predicting like the next period of hockey. I am not very confident in anything after that. That's right. Agreed. Agreed. And we'll talk about what's next for the Mavs, too. But we got some other stuff to talk about. Yeah, you guys had some experiences. Uh, you had quite the experience just getting into the ring. I, I think they brought me on here to so I could rant because I was on Twitter. Rant away. Ranting on Friday night. <laughs> Jason's we're, all about ranting. <laughs> we're we're at do. the point in the season, I think. And we'll call this like kind of fan stuff. But... We're at the point of the season where it's dark outside and uh, we've had snow and so some of us are a little bit more crabby than we might be in, say, October. I would definitely put myself in that boat. But there were a couple of things that happened this weekend that I, as a diehard fan, will put up with. But somebody who's coming for their first game or maybe has only been to a couple of games, it might turn them off. And that's what I was talking about on Twitter, and I wasn't the only one. Again, this it started on Twitter, but I was talking with a bunch of other fans both Friday and Saturday about their experiences coming into Baxter Arena, parking at Baxter Arena. There was apparently bathroom issues at Baxter Arena. Um, we can talk about some of the good things that they did. Uh, one of the things that we noticed uh, this weekend is that they had moved one of those merchandise stands. I know you guys talked a few weeks ago about the closing of the team store and how the placement of the merchandise in the Yeah, we were worked. pretty concerned about it being right at the top of the entryways there. So did they move? They moved one of them. They moved the one by the west staircase, by the west entrance. Where most fans come Where in. most fans okay. come in. They moved that one um, by the Godfather's Pizza stand. They moved it behind Section 110, so across from the Blue Line Club area in the south end, where southeast end of the ring, where there's more room to kind of roam back there because there's more space. Yeah. So what we would probably call the main entry because the box office and stuff's at the bottom of those stairs, right? So that's the one, the one you're talking that's about. That the one that's where they moved that. That's, yeah, that that's one. That's the yeah. one that moved. That one moved over 
basically the opposite side of the ring from where it was. Exactly. So instead of having kind of two right by both entrances, one by the suite entrance and one by what we would consider the main entrance, now they have the one that's still by the suite entrance, but the the other one moved down across from the Blue Line Club. And I don't... I, I didn't know it was there until we did a lap on Saturday. And we did a lap on Saturday because we noticed that the kiosk wasn't by the staircase near so we, the entrance. We so, didn't know if they'd gotten rid of it or what had happened to it. So we went looking for it on Saturday. But there was no mention of it that I saw that it had moved. So I definitely think they need to mention that. Like, hey, you know, fans, come get your merchandise Outside of section Section 110 or section whatever the other section is. Right, and have their save of the game and some of the other stuff that they definitely could be doing to encourage people to buy more merchandise. But like I said, we found it. We hope other fans did too. Um, So anyway, rant rant continued. So that was one positive thing. From a negative standpoint, um, I called it, hey, it's uh, non-enforcement night at Baxter Arena on Friday night. Because when we came in, we noticed that they were making exceptions to certain policies that they had normally been very strict about. In particular, I saw a woman with a bag that was not a clear bag, and they tagged it with an orange tag and letter in. Now, I did have someone who uh, tweeted at me and said, well, perhaps it was a medical bag. Um, I don't know. It did not look like um, it was a medical bag. She had a, a young girl with her that I thought at first was carrying like a baby, but it was a blanket. So I don't think that that was the case, Um, but it was one of a series of things that were not being enforced consistently. One of our friends, we're all familiar with the uh, stripped down TSA check, um, you know, where you have to unzip your coat and, you know, take your hat off and that sort of stuff. And she was asked to do it. And then the two people behind her were not. And that's my thing is like, okay, if we're going to have rules, let's have rules so that you know what to expect. But the inconsistency, I think, is what bothers me. Or at least state them as random coat check instead of the establishing the expectation that everyone's going to get coat checked. And then the second part of my rant is we've been told that these sorts of things are for our safety and security. Um, you know, we want to make sure that patrons are safe and secure at the game. So Saturday night, I came in uh, with my clear plastic bag. As always, I offer it up to our intrepid bag screeners and say, you know, have at it. And a young gentleman, am I allowed to name that young gentleman? All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to out him because I outed him on Twitter already. Joshua. Joshua, the young. We, we won't name him, but, we, we but won't his name is Joshua. Joshua. We, won't, yes. we won't name him, yes. but yeah. Well. <laughs> um, decided that he was going to take everything out of my bag. Yeah. See, normally what they do is they just take the bag, they hold it up. Part of the reason that they're clear bags that's the whole reason so for that, having so a clear they, bag. So they can quickly like look and see is there anything. And then occasionally they'll open there. up the top and they'll like shine a little flashlight or something sure. down there and try to look sure. down the middle. But and... this, but this time he decided to take kind of everything out and inventory it. And the worst part is I had just reorganized it. Like literally that afternoon, she had. I took everything out and I got it all nice. I had bought more streamers because I was feeling optimistic, and I have to admit, he found my bag of 12 mini candy candy canes that had been in there since November. Oh, yeah. And he told me that I would need to take them back out to the car. And I told my little friend, pseudonym Joshua, that it was fine. He could throw them away. They were a month and a half old. But again, is that for my safety and security? Are, if I had that in my purse, would that have been triggered? Can I not have gum or mints? Is 12 too many mini candy canes if I had had three or four, if they weren't in a baggie, if they were strewn throughout my bag, is that okay? Again, I don't know that safety and security is at risk for mini candy canes, but I can tell you as a customer, when you are subjected to that kind of an experience as your very first moment at a game, I'll put up with it. I'll keep coming back. We've got an attendance streak, but I don't know that there's a lot of people that that would put up with that when there's other ways they could spend their time and money. I know someone who's a bit of a conspiracy theorist and he will not fly. And the reason he gives for not flying is that he feels like this whole concept of TSA and stuff is essentially guilty until proven innocent rather than the other way around. And sometimes I feel like we're getting to the point with stadium entries and stuff that it's like, we're going to assume that you're a bad person until you can prove to us that you don't have a reason to be bad, I guess. 
I don't know. It seems like it seems like it was it was and we talked about it in the podcast when they started the clear bag policy. Like it was enough of a con- inconvenience to have to find and have clear bags that meet the size requirements anyways to then go and say not only that but even though we can see inside this thing we're still going to expunge everything inside of it to double check just seems oh and he made me mad he made me mad because then he started stuffing stuff back in there and i was like no you know this goes on the bottom and then this you took it out in this order put it back in it's kind of like i worry i have a little bit of a concern for joshua too in that if he were to let's say there was something in your bag that was breakable i don't know I mean, I know people who have inhalers. You drop that, you could break the inhaler, right? Right. And then you have a health crisis. Right. So you've got this stuff that, I mean, who's liable for something? Is he liable? Is the university liable? If you drop something that's valuable that I had in clear bag that meets your guidelines of things to bring in, who's responsible for replacing that? Because I did my due diligence. I made sure there's something I allowed to have in the facility. I put it in a clear bag that meets your guidelines that you stated. You still had the need to reach in and remove it from its container and your fault that it slipped off that table or got bumped or you dropped it because it just happens to people. Like it seems to me like they're putting themselves in a little bit of a predicament, you know, potential predicament, I guess. And someone brought that up to me. They said, wait, They took stuff out of your bag and like, you know, handled it. It was my understanding that they couldn't do that. And again, there's no, there's nothing on the signs that say, you know, hey, we may be handling your stuff. So that, that is definitely a good question. They are not law enforcement. They are, they're not even security. They're just just staff. staff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I know it's, yeah, it's, I mean, they'd probably just prefer you come in with your phone and. Well, men don't have this card. issue. I've got well, stuff, we don't. man. Yeah, we, I've we got don't. stuff. I, they will say, though, I mean, a lot of guys wear hats. They do make us take our hat off. They and made I, me take my hat off, too. That's not just a guy thing. When well, I yeah, when my, I mean, well, yeah. Well, I mean, when you're, I'm saying a lot of, yeah. I mean, I don't want to take anything away from the women who wear hats. But, but are we hiding guns under our hats? I mean, what exactly are we hiding under our hats? Well, I didn't say, that said, earlier this season, I did see someone when I was walking around the concourse who clearly had his concealed firearm oh visible for sure and and like i said so th- this is not a safety and security thing again this is my I'm rant like, this is bridget's this rant, is my rant. You, it's about concessions this is yeah but and again i when you talked I about you. it I'm, I'm like i cannot believe that they're going through all of this and i've literally seen someone in baxter with a gun well and the people i was talking to they're like you know, if you're going to smuggle stuff in, put it in your pockets. And I'm like, I wasn't trying to smuggle in 12 mini candy Candy. canes. Right. If I was trying to smuggle in it, I would have put it in my coat pocket, but I'd had it in my bag for two months. You could see them in the bag. Right. Again, it's it's candy. It's the equivalent of breath mints. It's not a roast beef sandwich. I understand the reason why you don't want someone to bring in like theater sized candy or sure, you yeah, know, like a box they're, of they're, they're like twelve tacos from Voodoo or something. Yeah, exactly. Like, I can yeah, get like why you that's yeah. a competition factor for you. Your candy canes shouldn't affect their bottom line. They were mini candy canes. That's the thing. They weren't even real good full size ones. They literally would be a breath. Mint. Maybe they were offended because you were still eating candy canes <laughs> after Christmas. <laughs> It's kind of like wearing white after Labor Day. I mean, maybe there's, it's, it's like a faux pas, you know, it's, it's, maybe you should have moved on to like, you know, some like shamrock okay. shaped. Uh, so to be fair, or, or, oh, like, Valentine's. to be fair, I also had a box of Valentine's candy. It was small. It was again, the equivalent of breath mints and Joshua did not confiscate that. So Joshua's going to get fired because he took my candy canes, but let me come in with my, you know, little heart candy. I'm sure. It's, it's very, I'll just say it's. It's just really tense coming into the. <laughs> it is. I'm just like I'm nervous every time. I'm like, God, oh, is this the week that the attendance streak ends for Bridget? And I'm just, I don't. Yeah, it's. So I, next week they're gonna have us taking our shoes off. Oh I yeah. Don't know. Strip search, full metal detector. You know, TSA. If I have to go through that check. whoosh whoosh machine. I She's, think I'm done. I know. We're just very much a kind of a civil libertarian about about this, which is which is fine. I, I I'm just saying. Bridget will tell you I don't like. There was one season like I didn't. 
And I don't even, they weren't even checking. This was down at the CenturyLink Center. I went without a coat. I didn't wear a coat to the game all season. She's like, why aren't you wearing a coat? I'm like, I have a goal this season to not wear a coat to any game. And there are a lot of games I don't wear a coat because I just, I don't like to unzip the coat. I mean, I'm fine with it if I wear a coat, but I'm like, well, since it's a short jaunt from the car, if we park in front of the arena, a lot of times I'll just wear the my sweatshirt or jersey or whatever. Yeah, I just, and a lot, sometimes I don't wear a hat either because I just don't want to take off the hat. It's just. But that's my point. Again, if we're trying to make Baxter Arena a welcoming environment, we're trying to get more new fans here. We're trying to have a positive atmosphere for the people that attend so they can cheer the fans on or cheer the team on as fans. Are we doing the right thing by having it be such a draconian, you know, experience literally two feet inside the door? That's that's all I'm that's all I'm saying. Well, and some I, I guess I don't know I don't know any college teams that have hired someone to do this, but I know NFL NBA teams that have hired someone whose job it is to they usually call them like fan engagement experts or something like that and a lot of times they have something to do with social media uh but they're really focused on like the fan experience from start to finish and the few people i know that have done this have all said that if you don't start with what it looks like and what that experience is when you open the door to the arena then you will always fail because you'll always be trying to correct an attitude rather than establish that attitude. And it's a lot easier to, you know, have people come through the door and have a good experience and be happy and keep them happy than it is to have them have a bad experience like you had coming through there and try to correct that with something else. And, you know, we say it, I, I know John will relate to this, but in, in advertising marketing, it's always easier and cheaper to keep a keep a, a buyer, a follower, a, a fan, a customer. It's always cheaper and easier to keep them in than it is to find a new one. Cost of ac- acquisition, right. absolutely. And I think that that's kind of the, the thing that the university needs to think about with Baxter then too, is, is that in, in so many things that we've talked about in this podcast about, you know, things that just kind of as as diehard fans just kind of rub us the wrong way sometimes are the things that will literally turn other people off and if if they're really in the business of wanting to spend a lot of money they'll do that by trying to have to constantly get new fans if they want to be the most efficient and effective at their dollars then they need to do that by focusing on keeping the fans that they have and that rather doesn't cost them money. So yeah. Right. Again, right. it's it's more of an attitude and a, an approach to things rather than, you know, throwing money right. at season ticket holders, which kind of ties us into, you know, the idea of growing growing new fans. There's a couple of things that they've done over the years that have really helped with that. One of them being skate with the maps. Um, right. It's one that I've used that event to introduce, especially folks with kids. Um, to uh, the program. They get to see the players up close and they get to get out on the ice at Baxter and it's an exciting event. And I haven't heard anything about a skate with the Mavs this year. No. And I, I thought about bringing it up on the podcast and then I'm like, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be that guy this season. <laughs> oh, apparently <laughs> I'm that like, girl. Was... <laughs> Don't worry. We've, we've our He's Bridget. waiting on me Bridget's to be that like, Bridget's like our pit bull on here. If I can't get Jason to do it, we're just going to bring Jay, We're going to bring Bridget on to say all the stuff <laughs> we don't want to say. It's, yeah, it's, I. It's well, too late now. Here's there's, what I was, there's I, no... I kept thinking they might make an announcement. And then when January 1st rolled around and they hadn't, I'm like, I, I feel bad because then I feel like we, we kind of like, shame them into doing it and and not in not in a bad way they usually seem but i didn't want them to like hurry up and do it. hurry up and put something together at the last minute because i think that that is something that then kind of inconveniences and it would be everybody last involved because the only opportunity for them to do it it has to be a weekend that they don't have hockey so yeah. the only opportunity for them to do it would be is... valentine's day weekend right yeah. yeah and i so that but there's a lot of kids that look forward to that there's a lot of families that look forward to that it's it is a neat event, but they definitely need to plan it well in advance. Right, and they've done it different ways. I remember at the CenturyLink Center, there were a couple seasons where they did the Skate with the Mavs, and they, they it was just for youth 
hockey players. So the youth hockey kids got invited, but other kids weren't able to go. And then the next season, then they did it, then they had some spots open, so they opened it up to others. But I always think that that's one to kind of bring sort of the general fan and the general kids to who aren't kids who normally get out on the ice and get to interact with those kind of guys. Because I always think it's kind of a fun deal. And it's one of those things I wish that they would put it on the calendar at the beginning of the season because I think it's a fun event. They've done a good job with it at Baxter Arena when they've had it. So I think people really enjoy it. But that's one of those fan service events that I wish that they would do because I think it's I wish they'd do more things throughout the season, as you and I have talked about, So, and I know Bridget agrees with that. So My kids love it, and I would even go as far as to say that part of the reason why the two of them play hockey is because of, in some small part, because of that experience that they had with the players, being able to meet them, being able to see them skate, you know, being able to see see the players as human beings kind of thing. Like you see a different side of them, right? It's the same thing that when we go to the season ticket holder events and and that where we pick up our tickets, like you get to talk to them and you get to ask them about stuff that's maybe not hockey related, you know, family and what their interests are and, you know, how good are they at Fortnite and things like that. And, (laughs) but it's, it's fun, right? Like it's, it's, it's not, you know, why didn't you score that goal or why didn't you make that save or something, you know, that I'm sure they hear so much. They don't need to hear it from fans. And and so they have those kinds of experiences and I can understand that maybe they look at it and say like, it's just too difficult to do. We can't, you know, make it work or something like that. Like I get that these things are hard to do, but you've got to look at it and say, it's important and we have to replace it. Like it can't just be something saying, Oh no, we can't. It's too, it's too difficult. I'm not going to try. Well, and that's the thing. The season ticket holder pickup, they had the autograph session there. But if you're not a season ticket holder, how do you introduce new fans to those experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing for them. And even though they had that, not all the players are there. No. Because some of them had classes. Yep. Yeah. And then one of the other events that we enjoyed that I know, and I heard that they tried to make it happen this season, but they weren't able to get it make, make it happen, was the Hockey 101s, which... In years past, what they would do is they would, a lot of times they would pick like a local bar. Um, Sometimes it was a a meeting room someplace and you would have the coaches come and they would break down film. They'd have a player or two on hand to do an equipment demonstration and the coaches would answer questions that fans had about the team. Now, I had heard that the version that they were trying to do of Hockey 101 was a Hockey 101 for women, which they had done back in the CenturyLink Center days. And I know... Bridge. I attended you, two of them. You attended two of them. So tell us a little bit about what you got to do at the Hockey 101s for women back, back then. Yeah. So they would start with the dinner. And again, it's kind of the format of the uh, current Blue Line Club dinner where you would have players at your table, which again was unique at that time um, as a way of interacting with the players. But then they also had on ice uh, skills work. So we were out there in our regular shoes, but we got to shoot the puck with the sticks, the actual sticks the players use. And I was talking to John about this. Most of the people that are in the stands at Baxter Arena are not Jasons. They haven't, you know, played hockey. Mm -hmm. They um, didn't grow up, you know, most of the folks around here know football and basketball and volleyball because they grew up with it. A lot of them, especially years ago, didn't have that experience with hockey, although I'm glad your girls are getting that now. Um, so they don't know the finer intricacies. There's one of our friends, for example, who's a fairly recent fan. He'll ask me questions about, you know, things like if they can check the goaltender when he's out of the crease when we were watching the Western goalie <laughs> uh, this weekend. Like, can we just take him down? And I pulled up the actual rules on my phone. No. So I don't like the idea. No. The answer was no. <laughs> the answer correct. No. <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I don't know that we want to do Hockey 101 for women. I think we should do just Hockey 101s. And I think a good place to start would be what John was talking about with what they used to do in terms of, you know, having it in a a room where you could watch film. And the goaltender equipment demonstrations were hilarious and immensely fascinating. I think Dan Ellis was one of them back in the day that they would come and they would put on all their gear and then they would take off all their gear. And I think that kind of experience is a good way to start. But I do think having that opportunity for more you know, hands-on and in-depth stuff gives those fans that are often, I guess, you know, they'd be armchair quarterbacks for football, uh, whatever the equivalent is for hockey, 
it gives you a better appreciation when you've never played the sport before to feel what it's like on the ice and, and have that and be like, whoa, you know, these sticks are a little unwieldy. Um, I just, again, going back to that idea, I think if you want to introduce new people to the game, help them understand it, help them connect. And if it's too much of a burden on the current players and the current coaches, there's a lot of old bowls around town. And that would be something that, again, they had done in years past when they were players. I think they would be happy to come back and, and help with that kind of outreach. There was, I think it was 2005, 2006. Uh, there's a, out here in West Omaha, there was a wine store, you know, just generic cell wine, right? And the guy who who owned it and ran it had somehow coordinated to have one of the assistant coaches uh, under Kemp come out and talk about the team and answer questions. And yeah, you know, there exactly. were, there were like yep. maybe eight or 10 of us or something that like, I went just because talking, I'm like, I don't, I, I think he was annoyed by my question. <laughs> um, Cause it was right before we were, it was right before you and I was going to make the transition to the WCHA. Uh, and I had, I had asked the question about like, how are you going to deal with the likes of Denver and that? Because WCH having come from Denver, I'm like, WCHA hockey at that time was a get ready he different just, beast he just, from the he CCHA. He just believes in the the WCHA exceptionalism. That's what he. <laughs> Back I know then, we've yeah. talked about. I know Jason North tells Dakota, me. Jason tells me Denver, it was hard yeah. to get on board with the Mavs back then because he was a WCHA guy and he yeah. he wanted to see him playing against those teams. So you got your wish in the uh, 2009 2010 oh. season. So yeah, when they went when then the, when when they went NCHC, I was like, this is like this is the best, the cream of the crop, the best of the yeah, best. Yeah, right. We we cut all the slough out <laughs> of the WCHA. Yeah, cut off the all the SEC chaff of college hockey. Dun, dun, dun. With the exception of Miami, Ohio. But that, that actually in. sounds like what they would do for Hockey 101. That yeah. almost sounds like wine tasting with Kinda. the Mavs, but I'm totally, but, I'd be down I mean, with maybe, that too. Yeah. Maybe that's it. You, you, you know, come up with a partnership with some. some... <laughs> 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 I have no some idea what's idea. happening here. Yeah. Door. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you come up with, you know, some organization or something, some chain restaurant for all I know, Olive Garden or something, throw something out there, right? And just. Go to a couple different locations. Have yeah, we some liked it and stuff. And, and I'm again, I'm not. A, I I think we would be fine if they did the hockey 101 for women. But I know, like you mentioned, it's a it's a friend of ours. He's new to the game, so he has a lot of questions, and he might have a lot more questions than a lot of the the female hockey fans of this team, like Bridget. You know, I think I think he would benefit from that deal too. So hockey 101 for everyone. That's, that's yeah, and if you have to pitch. limit participation, <laughs> limit participation. But it's fun to get to hear from the coaches and the players and have them break down film. That was that was early on in the program. That was the first time because I didn't know a lot about hockey. We had David Quinn breaking down UNO's you know umbrella formation mm -hmm. on the power play, and we're on like, the, yeah, on the yeah, and it was it was very very cool to obviously hear from one of the you know best amateur coaches and now the New York Rangers head coach. I mean, it was great to hear from him. So that was. Well, and again, I think, you know, 20 years in for Mav Puck, people assume that, you know, we have we know hockey, you know, like we've always known hockey. And again, we were not like Jason. Our experience when we started following UNO hockey was a couple of Lancer games during high school. Yeah. So we've learned a lot over this amount of time, and I don't want hockey to be intimidating for people. I want it to be accessible. I want them to come and experience the joy that we have found out of it, but... If they don't understand it, that's a lot harder to do. Right. Uh, ready to talk about what is on the horizon for our Mavericks? Well, I don't know. Maybe we should talk about clear bags. Some <laughs> <laughs> Might be a more pleasant <laughs> let's, topic. Let's bring up another. <laughs> we haven't talked about parking yet. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> don't get me started. Okay. So the Mavs are currently in sixth place. Tied for fifth. Tied but, for fifth yeah. with St. Cloud State. St. Cloud State had a good weekend against Minnesota Duluth. So, so we're we're still seven points. Right? Did they play Duluth? out of fourth place? No, didn't St. Cloud play? Oh, St. Cloud no. played Miami. They played I'm Miami. sorry, Duluth they played Denver. Yeah, I was gonna say Duluth came in the the 
radio guy from UMD was saying, are the sweet, are the streets in Denver cleaner? They look like they've been swept. Yeah, because so, J- Jason and I last week were <laughs> hoping that UNO would sweep Western Michigan and then Denver would sweep Duluth and then we would have been knocking on the door of third place. But right. that Sadly. did not happen. Nope. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, Denver is in fourth place now. So we're in sixth place and we head to Duluth. 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 So Minnesota to to Duluth, building. that's a tough that's a tough series up there. Yeah. They've been kind of a yo-yo team a little bit this season, too. I mean, they've had stretches they where they've been really, really good, and then they've had stretches where you think, why are you in the top four of your conference? So, but they played really well in Denver. They you know, All four games that they've played against Denver have been extremely entertaining and very close, and I think they're three out of the four. They, I, I think they actually have a tie out of that. So they've played Denver probably harder than... Most yeah, of the other they get up for those Denver. games. That's for sure. And they, I hope, sw- they, which, I hope they don't get up for our game. Maybe which they'll a lot just of times, overlook us. They swept you, you us back that in into November, it, right? Like a lot of times, what that means is is that you're going to have a letdown when you have a team like Omaha come in. Hope so. I'll take it. Yeah, we'll take whatever we can get at this point because we need points. Because we yeah. got to stay in fifth place. You know, that's my goal for this team. We do have a series in hand on St. Cloud, though, so we do have two more games to play than they do. True, but currently they have the tiebreaker because of our head-to-head. So, and so we need to we need to take advantage of the points when we can get them. And if you look at this, I don't know if they're idle this week or not. But if this is the week that St. Cloud's idle and and we are not, then this is a prime opportunity for us to to maybe jump them and and put some space. You know, we put some nice space between us and Cairo College. We need to start putting some space between us and St. Cloud and Miami if we're going to we just need if we're going to make John a not correct a and finish in our, our fifth place position. Well, yeah, and I think I had cuz I know Jason went back and listened to that episode, he probably doesn't remember, but I think I had St. Cloud finishing behind UNO, which early in the season that seemed crazy. So, yeah, we've got to make that happen so that it looks like I know what I'm uh I know what I'm talking. About. <laughs> <laughs> They Except I think are... we both thought Miami would be at the bottom. And so Colorado here's is at here's the, bottom, the thing: so. Saint Cloud is at Colorado College this weekend. Oh man, I can't I know. cheer for CC. I can't do it. I know, but that's that's a series where they could get some points, yeah. and they're used to playing on the Olympic size sheet. They yep. might not be used to the high altitude, but uh, yeah, so that's going to be a tough one. So we've got to go into Duluth and get some points. This we got to have positive results this weekend. It might be pivotal. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, I love the uh, minute and a half where I was saying pivotal, and I'm looking at Jason last week. I had I was no idea what you were talking Trying about. to say pivotal, and I'm just looking, and I'm like, pivotal, pivotal? And Jason's just looking at me. It's like, dude, tell me what I'm supposed to be saying here. That's Speak why you're here. for me already. Oh my gosh, we dude. We have no idea what John's talking dude, what? about. Dude, what? You're not a puppet. But this could be another pivotal weekend for the Mavs. We got to get some points. So, what do you guys think? What's it going to be? Anybody? I say split. I think we find a way to win a game against them. I like to say Friday, but we just seem to play better on Saturday. But I think we split with them. John, what do you think? Well, we've been playing well on the road as of late. True. The guys know what needs to be done. They know where they are in the standings. They know that I want them to finish fifth. (laughs) So they're Everyone obviously, knows. that's why they got the win Saturday night. They're like, man, he's going to be pissed off on that podcast if uh, we don't get this thing done. <laughs> so I'm going to say, oh, it's hard. Minnesota Duluth is playing well, but they're coming off the high. Coming off the, you know, <laughs> a mile, a mile <laughs> high. What kind what of high are you referring to? I don't know that they went to a dispensary while they were in uh, Denver, but. You never know. Hey, I'm maybe gonna... they'd be in our favor. I'm going to say that we split. I'm okay. going to say that we, like the last couple weekends, I'm going to say we play better on Saturday than on Friday, and I'm going to say we get the Saturday win. Okay. I, I'm the pessimist of okay, the group, go. apparently. Um, <laughs> That's my normally mom Jason. Always says, my mom always says, are they going to win? I'm like, I don't think so. So as much as I would love to see them go in there and get at least a split – 
I just I don't know if Abate is not back. Um, I'm definitely saying they're going to get swept. I think they've missed him tremendously. Um, it was nice to have Polkanen back on Saturday night. I hope we can keep him healthy. Hope we can keep all the guys healthy. But I, my gut's just saying I think that these are not conference points we're going to get. So I'm going to say we're going to get swept. Sorry, guys. That's all right. That's yeah. all right. I, the the thing is, is we're just pundits. Uh, you know, the boys have control, right? Prove me wrong. Yeah, they can go wrong, out guys. there and they skate the way that they've played last few series, especially the way they played against Denver. You know, I Denver's Denver, but I think if you play the way that you played against Denver against Duluth, yep. you beat Duluth. And they've got eight games left, and they've got it. They've got to get it done. You're chasing St. Cloud. And you're chasing Western Michigan. Hell, you're chasing Denver too. So they've got to they've got to make their mark the next eight regular season games. So my two keys would be stay out of the box and don't spot the other team a three goal lead. Just <laughs> do those two things, and I'll feel much better. I think my key is both the power play and the penalty kill. Stay stay out of the box, limit the opportunities that the the other team has, and our power play needs to produce in the mid to high twenties. I think we were 25% on the weekend against Western Michigan. You know, if we can, if we can be anywhere 25 and and above at the end of the weekend, you're going to have a pretty good chance. In particular on Friday when they had, you know, even strength opportunities, but when they had power play opportunities, it felt like they were just passing it around looking for that perfect tic-tac-toe kind of backdoor deal. And they just need to start putting pucks on net and playing well down low and putting in those grimy, greasy kind of junk goals because that, that yeah. was their game last season. When they had success, that's what they did, and that's the kind of that's what they need to do. I've said it before. Start to finish, whether you're on the power play or not, this team needs to make decisions faster. Yep. You know, because a lot of times they, they kind of think their way out of the right decision sometimes. That's yeah. why we have some poor turnovers. Uh, and a lot of times we pass up good opportunities – trying to find a great one when take what you're given yeah make a quick decision adapt and react shoot early and shoot often right yeah Yeah, absolutely okay well so till next week yeah and it was great having bridget on today's episode was and yes until i don't know what don't you follow you you your whole follow us on this yes i'm getting ready to do that i don't know how this works i'm like don't wrap it up yet (laughs) okay go okay Well, be sure to follow Mav Puck on Twitter. Bridget. I didn't tweet on Saturday because I was mad. Sorry, she I'll was, be back. Yeah, she was upset about well, the whole thing. But we won. Are you allowed to come back? He had to stay in the basement. <laughs> he got to come up the next night. So I oh, yeah. So I was, I was, I was just tweeting all in emojis and GIFs on uh, Saturday night. So we won that way. So I may be doing that again. So follow Mav Puck on Twitter and see, see what, what happens do. this weekend. Who knows? Follow us on Facebook. Follow us. Oops, on the website, mavpuck.com. Like, oh. <laughs> we got all kinds of... We got, all kinds we of got sound effects, effects in this episode. <laughs> everything else. <laughs> Just follow <laughs> mavpuck. And if you want to listen to past episodes of the podcast, you can find all of those on the website as well. So we would encourage you to do that. So until next time, go Mavs. Go, go Mavs. Mavs.